So I will start recording before I forget. So I hope everyone had a good weekend. We're going to uh, jump back into the fun with uh, alloy solidification. So I had a question from a student over the weekend that I thought was worth um, worthwhile just taking a couple quick seconds. It's not really a technical question. It's more about a, it was like a class pacing question. Um, and they looked at sort of the things that I wanted to cover in the syllabus versus the time it's taken us to get through heterogeneous materials and solidification and we're a little concerned. Um, and I'm not, um, simply because most of the, there's been a lot of really um, sort of important theoretical things that have taken a lot of time to get sort of sorted, such as, you know, the common tangent construction and the nucleation theory. And when we, when you see that when we get to diffusional phase transformations, um, that uh, it's basically ex all, it's exactly the same, the nucleation aspects of it and this phase stability stuff comes from things we've already covered. So, those topics will go much faster because you've already had a um, um, a really good solid uh, theoretical grounding in these topics, right? So I'm not really worried about spending a little bit more time than I had originally planned on this simply because, you know, it makes it makes, if you understand this better now, it makes learning things, um, the other topics in the future a little bit easier. Uh, so, okay, compositional supercooling. Okay. Do I have, is anyone feeling brave enough who spent some time over the weekend to talk about this with me? the reading or the homework um just thinking about what we talked about on friday in lecture okay i'll go do my obligatory discussion for the day okay so is this a this is i think this is a, probably a good figure to be on um everyone's volunteering you so I know I know I could pick on Max next for uh, the next question. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. <laughs> All right, your question. Okay, so um, um, so the the question basically was just who who feels that they may have enough of an understanding to sort of explain this compositional supercooling nonsense. Okay. Uh, well, here's what I know from the reading. Okay. Compositional supercooling occurs when the temperature gradient of, of the, I think, solute entering the liquid is not very steep. Okay. When it's a nice slow, which permits the, I think, dendritic growth, correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. So when the gradient's slower than this little uh, line, you can't see my cursor, but I'm pointing at the critical gradient right there. Yep. When the gradient is less than that, it strays into this region here, which allows the fourth of the dendritic solid, and thus that area where the solid is forming becomes super cool. Okay, so let's talk about real fast the origin of uh, the super cooling real fast, right? Mm -hmm. So, why do we have this solute gradient, this concentration gradient in front of the solid liquid interface? Why do we have that gradient there? Yeah, this curve, this XL. You guys because, can see my cursor, right? Because um, solute is being rejected into the liquid phase, which 
causes and effects. Okay. So when we talked about the Scheil equations, we said we had perfect mixing, mm -hmm. right? So what's the case going on here, right? We don't have perfect mixing anymore. We just have... This is not perfect mixing. This is a solute being rejected into it at a decreasing rate as it goes on. Okay. So it's, this is, we have diffusional mixing in the liquid. So there's, it takes time for the liquid composition to homogenize, right? So we've got this pile up region that has a characteristic width to it, right? And that width depends on how fast we're solidifying, how fast this interface is moving, or another way of thinking about it is how fast the solute is being rejected by the solid and how fast it can move away, right? Is so it, it, is there less and less liquid or as this goes on? So right now we can think about this as this liquid is infinite in extent, mm -hmm. right? So the amount of liquid we have right now is large compared to the width of this pile up layer, right? So we've got a whole lot out here. Um, but yeah, as it goes on, we will have less and less liquid, right? But for right now, let's just think that the liquid is, we've got a whole bunch of it, right? So we've got this layer where solute is piled up, right? And at the interface, we always have local equilibrium, right? So when our solute concentration is X naught over K, right? This composition given here, our solute is always solidifying at X naught, which is our alloy composition, right? But out in front, out here, our liquid far away is actually here at the alloy composition X naught temperature, right? And we can see that the freezing temperature at the interface is cooler than the freezing temperature of the liquid way out here. So that means as we move out, we have a greater and greater undercooling, right? So that means the farther we, we, can, we move into this solid region, the greater um, driving force we have for solidification. And that's what leads to this compositional supercooling, right? And so, it seems like kind of an abstract concept, but when you play with, when you actually just think about what is the, the freezing temperature as you move out into this gradient, it should be, become pretty clear, right? So the critical gradient to avoid unstable growth has to do with this freezing range T1 to T3, right, which is the freezing range for this alloy composition, divided by the width that it needs that, the, that this pile up is, right? So the gradient basically says I need to be, I need to have a temperature gradient that's steeper than my freezing range divided by the width of this pile up. Right? And then this way I'll avoid any undercooling, under any compositional undercooling, right? So I'm not going through the math to show what any of this is or, you know, why, where, where this comes from. I really just sort of, you know, this is, you know, I think if it was a graduate class, we would really get into the theory behind this. But for you guys, I think it's just important to understand that, that Compositional supercooling is a thing, how we get into it and be able to maybe do some calculations with what this critical gradient is. But intuitively it makes sense that we need to get above, we need to, to have a, a gradient that's steep enough that we cover the entire temp temperature range, freezing temperature range in the same distance as this pile up is. Right, and that means we skirt this compositional supercooling region.
So just like in thermal dendrites, we break up, we can, if we get a small protrusion, right, this is now going, growing into a higher supercooled region and it's going to grow faster than the surrounding, right? It's also in 3D, right? So this is going to reject solute. And because this is growing and this is growing, we're going to have a lot more solute here, right? And that's um, having this extra pileup of solute here versus at other points along the interface, this is going to retard growth. Right, because we'll actually have, if we consider that we need local equilibrium here, um, right, we now have sort of, we now have less of a driving force uh, uh, for, for growth at this point, and we actually form this oscillating interfacial structure that grows into these um, long fingers. And the important thing is that these long fingers are going to grow parallel to the direction of heat flow. Right? So we form, we form a protrusion, we form recesses next to the protrusion, so these actually form with a characteristic wavelength and spacing, and there's a lot of really cool theory that goes into being able to predict this wavelength, the, this, uh, this spacing that we're sort of glossing, glossing over here to get the main ideas, okay? As these grow- So, quick question. Yeah. So a higher, like a larger planar solidification front leads to more compositional supercooling. Is that the relationship I'm getting from this? I'm not sure what you mean by larger planar solidification front. So the solute, planar, solid, planar solidification fronts are created when solute is rejected and piles up at the root, correct? Yeah, so let's, so what we say, we have a planar interface here, mm -hmm. all right? So we're rejecting solute in front of this interface. Yes. Okay. And um, so what I was trying to say is the more solute rejected, the larger the compositional supercooling, correct? The more solute rejected, the larger the so compositional supercooling is going to be, right? Right, or another way of thinking about that is the larger this equilibrium freezing range is, right? Okay. The larger your compositional supercooling is gonna be, right? At this first picture, the concentration gradient, there's a gradient in X, but it's uniform in Y, right? It's just, this is growing, these are all growing by atomic jumps, right? And so it's a stochastic process. So what happens is at some region along here, you get a spot where you, you have a few more atomic jumps than its neighboring spots and you get a very, very small protrusion like this that forms, right? And then that, this little hump just has a tiny bit more driving force to grow than the neighboring surrounding interface. So it starts to grow out uh, faster and faster. And as it does that, it rejects solute not only in front of it to the side. So in B, we now have a composition gradient going both in X and in Y. Right, and that composition gradient in X and Y leads to this cellular, cellular structure. All right. As we reject solute into this interdendritic region, right it this is going to be a very different composition than what's um 
in between, and actually this will form a, a typically a eutectic, right? So in a binary phase, what we'll have is we'll have the cells that are alpha phase, and the region in between the cells is gonna be a mixture of alpha and beta. And we'll talk about that in more detail um, with the slides I put up last night on dendritic solidification, right? That we'll probably talk about on Wednesday and that'll be the last topic of examinable material, right? Um, this, the analysis of these, of this situation is actually really cool. The mathematical analysis is pretty, is pretty complicated. Um, and we're not going to talk about it, but what I want to do is, is get some qualitative discussion about what's happening um, in these situations, right? Huh, something went wonky with my numbering. We're on slide 10 of nine, right? Um, but what you do is you get growth that looks like this. So these are the planar fingers that form in this case, this is in a carbon tetraboride, so an or organic compound. Here is a, uh, a lead tin alloy. So this is like a so uh, what solder used to be made out of before they had, had uh, um, the big drive to reduce lead. And here the cellular growth direction is out of the screen at you. So you can see here we have the cellular dendrites that are growing and in between is this is the eutectic the the lead tin eutectic that forms. Right? So in in 3D and it, it these actually sort of have a faceted structure um to them, right? And this faceting comes about because of the low, the low energy interfaces that happen, right? So I, I, I think this is a pretty cool arrangement personally, but it's just me. And there's a transition that happens from, uh, cellular growth where we get these fingers to dendrites, right? Essentially, we, you start to get uh, instabilities along the length of these as well, and you start to grow secondary dendrite arms here. So this is uh, carbon tetrabromide, tetrabromide um, cellular growth that's just beginning to transition into dendrites, right? The secondary arms are starting. Um, and this transition is not really fully understood. The thermal and composition gradients and everything that are happening in, the, in, your, in your solid are really complicated and there isn't a really great physical theory of exactly how this happens, right? We just know that, you know, the, what we talked about before still applies, but actually predicting this transition is quite complicated because it, it depends so much on the local temperature gradients and the local composition gradients and the efficiency of mixing and convection currents that form. And so this is still, really an open area of research and discussion, but it just does happen, right? Okay, so that's it for dendritic growth. Um, I want to talk about an application actually now. What is going on? My Somehow my, my outlines have disappeared. So that's weird. Okay, so I want to talk about a topic here, um, this is, you know, the, the second extra topic. So we talked about pol uh, um, polymer, uh, uh, the thermodynamics of polymers as a little bit of an extra. Zone refining here is a little bit of an extra. And I really wanted to talk about this because I wanted to make sure the, the people who are 
interested in sort of functional materials, right, don't feel that this solidification stuff that we all talked about isn't really relevant. Um, uh, to, to them, um, and I think one of the, there's a couple different applications where, of course, it is obviously crystal growth um, for growing, you know, uh, large single crystal silicons, right? Those are melt processed, melt processed um, uh, big crystal ingots, right? But of course, because of the nature of the bonding, um, you end up with a nice planar interface so you don't get uh, all of the uh, issues that you do with solidification of metals. Um, and they're also, those are uh, very high purity. So you don't have any of the effects with compositional supercooling and things like that. So a lot of the solidification stuff we talked about metals because that's sort of where the important technological applications are, right? A lot of metal, uh, metal castings are highly important solidifications of welds and additive manufacturing are really technologically important processes. Um, but I think one really, really important uh, process for the functional material folks is this zone refining, right? So we need really High purity metals and semiconductors, I should add, and semiconductors are really critical for a range of functional devices, right? So solid state electronics would be really impossible without high purity silicon and other semiconductors. High purity metals are really important for doping and, and applications and other things. Um, and generally, when we talk about high purity, we're talking about five nines or five N purity, which is 99.999%, right? And so, you know, here's just a couple metals um, and talking about sort of where they're used in semiconductor and functional devices, um, right? I think one of the uh, really cool areas are these three five semiconductors. Um, Anyone working with Professor Grassman or knows Professor Grassman, this is a huge area of his research. Um, and it's, I think it's, it's kind of really cool and exciting. Um, but anyway, so if we step back like 60 years now, right, the transistor was invented in 1947. And of course, you know, John Bardeen and Walter Bertin both at Bell Labs, they won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, what's interesting, I thought, is the transistor as a theoretical device was proposed in 1926, but they couldn't construct it because there was no way at this time of getting high purity um, materials, right? So if we had better materials processing, we could have had solid state electronic devices before World War II. Um, and if you think about what that could have potentially meant for things like radar and wireless communications is pretty, uh, pretty amazing, right? I mean, you think about field radios that people had in, in a battlefield that had a bunch of uh, vacuum tubes in it. Um, it doesn't seem particularly robust, but you know, what What could have World War II looked like if we actually had solid state electronics? Um, but anyway, so once the transistor came on the scene, people really, um, there was a real commercial need for these high purity material supplies, right? And zone refining uh, was the technique that was used um, to produce these. It was invented in 1951. 
Um, uh, John Desmond Bernal sort of came up with the first prototype, um, but William Fahn really gets most of the credit because he took kind of this initial idea and really refined it and made it work, okay? And uh, so this is Fahn here. Um, what I want to point out here is how important this technique was commercially. So the patent rights for this made Bell Labs a lot more money than the patents on the transistor, right? Because essentially what happened was is there were many different types of transistors that were invented um, by a bunch of different people and they all had different patent rules, but they all needed pure materials to make them. And zone refining essentially was the only game in town. So the patent uh, licensing revenue essentially paid for Bell Labs complete operating expenses uh, for a long period of time. The equivalent of this is, does anyone know, right? Everyone of course knows MP3s, right? As a now sort of uh, a revolutionary, but now a little outdated file format. Um, but where was the MP3 invented? What are MP3s? The music file format. I guess now with streaming, no one has to pirate anything anymore. But anyway, so the, so um, I guess I'm I'm uh, forgetting forgetting. Uh, how young you guys are that like you probably never um okay a couple people know what mp3s are so no one no one uh i guess had an iP ipod um i did but, okay but anyway so the mp3 file format was invented by um the fraunhauer institute in germany and much like uh zone refining, the licensing fees for the MP3 patent actually paid for the entire scientific institute in Germany to run for quite, for, for, um, for a good chunk of time, right? But anyway, so zone refining, the first commercial product was high purity germanium, right? And they were able to get germanium crystals of one part per 10 billion. Uh, using this technique. So how does this work? Well, essentially it uses this, the theory that we just talked about, right? So if I have a, a alloy of composition Shino here and I melt it and then re-solidify it, my solid is going to have less solute in it than the liquid. I'm going to reject uh, solute from the solid as it freezes into the liquid, right? So the segregation coefficient, our K, our partition coefficient, um, is going to typically be less than one. At the solid liquid boundary, the impurity atoms are going to diffuse into the liquid so if we have here, essentially, instead of melting the whole bar and doing directional solidification, what if we have a little heater that moves? And so we only have a tiny little bit of liquid. liquid. And we refreeze behind it. So basically, as we pass this over, as we move this heater along the bar, the crystal that grows behind the heater is going to be of less concentration than the liquid in the heater regime, right? And then we can do multiple passes, many passes. And each time we pass it, what's left behind 
is a little bit cleaner because the solute is continually rejected to this liquid region. Then at the end, we have a region where all of our solutes concentrate and we just cut that off. And then we have a bar that is, is pure enough, right? So that's essentially how this works, right? So here's the math. We can skip, we can really sort of, of skip this. But if here is our, um, this is sort of what it looks like with each pass. So this is 10 passes. This is our, our concentration of the solid divided by our initial concentration. So 10 to the zero or one is where we started at, right? You can see it, the first pass, we have a whole region here that's um, lower in, pure, lower in uh, composition. And at each pass, we get more and more pure, right? And this is a ratio, so this isn't an absolute concentration. So essentially here at the beginning, you know, we're five million times less solute than we did at the beginning, right? This is a log scale. So essentially, if we start out with metal that is 99% pure, and we're trying to get to five nines, right, because this is a log scale, if we replotted this as a linear scale, it would be like, mm, bing, and then we would just cut this, this end off. And everything down here is good, right? But in, in reality, what you can do is we have multiple passes, we reach our saturation, we cut our bad stuff off, and then we can do zone refining from the other end to homogenize this out at some low value. And that's called zone leveling, right? Which there's a, a homework uh, um, question on, right? But, and that I just gave you most of the answer to inadvertently. Uh, <clears throat> but, but anyways, you, so we reach sort of a steady state uh, con composition profile and it's gonna depend on a couple different things, right? So it's gonna depend on how wide this heater is, how, how much liquid we have, how fast we traverse, right? And what the uh, initial composition of our solid is, right? But we, the cool thing is here, um, we can use, because the, this composition zone is so small and it's this, this melted liquid is so small and because it's moving we get really good convection currents so perfect mixing is a really good approximation so we could just use the shile equation to predict the composition right and if you just keep running a shile analysis over each one you see we hit this we hit this steady state that's going to depend on a, a couple things here where Z is the width of the, um, of the melt, the melt region, right? And so that's, uh, that's zone refining in a nutshell. Um, there's some cool analysis and modeling you can do, but this is a really, really just important commercial um, uh, processing route to get to to get high purity uh, metals and uh, semiconductors that we need for electronics, right? And zone melting, this is still repeatedly done today. This isn't some technology that was important back in the day. Um, so it, it's not super fast, right? 
Right. You obviously you need to move the heater um, at slow, not slow, but you need to give time for the solute to move around. Right. So this is not like a super fast process, but it can be done on really long uh, ingots. And essentially what you can see here is that you can have multiple heaters traversing. Right. So you can have these multi-zone refining. Um, uh, so you can imagine having like 20 of these things set up, right? And having a crystal ingot just continuously fed through here, right? Um, it's not really outdated, right? Because um, it's it's still sort of the go-to for purifying um, a lot of the specialty metals. It's not used as much for um, the semiconductors anymore because we have really good techniques for crystal growing, right? So the silicon wafers that are the basis for all um, um, integrated circuits, right? Those are grown um, essentially from a high purity uh, liquid bath by the, you know, the crystal growing process. So that's, this isn't needed to produce high quality silicon and germanium anymore. And a lot of the devices are made by um, um, epitaxial growth methods, right? Either, you know, molecular beam epitaxy or um, um, vapor deposition type uh, techniques, right? So it's not used so much for device fabrication. But it is needed to make the metal targets for PVD and um, um, epitaxy and other processing techniques, right? So it's still uh, commercially really, really important. It's just not used as much to make finished products. It's used to make the materials that go into the steps that make the, the finished product. Does that make sense? Uh, could this be paired with an extruder to get 5N pure right out of the gate? Um, so the question though is then what uh, what are you feeding into the extruder, right? Right, so essentially we have a bar. Oh, you mean like, so generally this would be, for metals, this would be a casting here, right? That is a bar-shaped directionally solidified casting. Because if you do directional solidification, you get the solute rejection, directional freezing, right? And so you can get a higher pure, uh, uh, a relatively high pure purity um, casting, right? And then the zone refining is used to clean up, right? So this, this isn't used to go from say 5% purity to try and um, right, this goes from, this goes from what would be considered commercial purity of 99.9% .9 or higher to um, uh, ultra high purity, right, five nines, right? So this goes from three nines, three nines to five nines, essentially, right? Or concentrations that you can get from normal casting uh, processes 
two compositions that you can that you need for electronics. Right. Okay, so this is the last we're going to finish this up um, on Wednesday. So this is the last set of notes that are relevant for the exam. You'll notice this one is not particularly quantitative, right? A lot about what we're talking here is sort of just sort of conceptually thinking about what happens um, when we solidify two phase material, when we uh, do a large scale ingot solidification and a little bit with solidification in fusion welds. Um, right? So, um, that's sort of the, the topic, right? So if we think about here, we have our, the composition profile that we get from our Scheil equation. And the question is what happens when we reach this eutectic composition, right? So remember the eutectic is defined as liquid freezes to both alpha and beta. So back here, we're, freezing into the single phase alpha region. But when we're in the eutectic, this eutectic range, now we have a mixture of alpha and beta. So we need to consider what happens when two phases solidify uh, together, right? So here's just sort of a schematic, right? we can def divide our liquid up into pro-eutectic, meaning comes before the eutectic, depending on where we are in the composition, and then the eutectic region, right? So our final microstructure here, if I come down at this, say, 40% tin in this, this lead tin, um, phase diagram, I'm going to have alpha plus liquid, right? So I'll have alpha that forms, but then when I get to the end, I'm going to have a bunch of these now alpha regions surrounded by uh, the alpha beta eutectic, right? So if I come down directly at the eutectic composition, I typically end up with like a lamellar structure. I have layers of alpha and layers of beta, right? In a way, this is very similar to perlite in steel, right? In that case, I have layers of iron surround between layers of uh, cementite, right? But here, so it's very much similar in the sense I have a two-phase composite that forms on solidification, right? And as you can imagine, this is a highly heterogeneous mixture, right? And the properties of this are going to depend very much on the dispersion of these alpha phases and this, the contrast in properties between the alpha and beta phases and the morphology of the alpha and beta phase. So, you know, this gives, this is a really complicated system here, right? And there's a lot of room for optimization here. All right, we can tweak our alloy composition, we can tweak our cooling rates and things like this to try and get the best possible microstructure here. Okay, so what does this lamellar eutectic look like? Well, this is an aluminum copper, right? And so we can see essentially we have layers of aluminum, layers of copper that, that form here, right? And I always thought this is a pretty cool, pretty cool looking structure. 
all right? We can also have these rod-like eutectic structures where instead of forming layers, our eutectic phase forms thin needles that go through our structure, right? So, you know, you can think of it like the, the secondary phase forms these rods that form it sort of this uniform spacing, right? You can see this isn't random, right? This is a pretty regular arrangement of these eutectic rods that form through our microstructure, right? So if we think about this solidification front, right, in this, of this, this eutectic, right, our two phases have to grow cooperatively, right? Because our alpha phase is rich in element A, our beta phase is rich in element B, which means that we need that as alpha grows, it's going to be rejecting B into our liquid. And as beta grows, it's going to be rejecting A into our liquid. So we need to diffuse A from a region in front of beta to alpha and B from the region in front of alpha to beta. Right? So the rate at which this can grow, this layered lamellar eutectic, is going to depend on how fast this mass transfer can be or how fast alpha and beta can diffuse in the liquid. Right? So obviously, if the distance, if the the growth of this depends on how fast diffusion can occur, right? What's from 2010, what's the important relationship that you learned about diffusion? What's the time scale for diffusion? Or how fast does something diffuse in a given amount of time? Right? Anyone remember? Square root dt is the, the bit that comes from your, your fixed law analysis. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that coming up soon, right? But so if the distance that diffusion ha happens depends on the square root of time, and we want to speed this up, essentially what this, this tells us is that if we want the fastest possible growth velocity, we should have the thinnest possible layers so that the diffusion has to happen over a shorter distance. So if we make these alpha and beta layers really fine, we can have the fastest possible growth and the most efficient, the most efficient system. However, we have interface that we're creating here. The more layers we have, the finer this layer spacing, the more alpha beta interface that we're creating. And like all interfaces, there's an energy penalty. There's a surface energy associated with this alpha beta interface. So we can't make them too fine, right? The ideal situation from purely a diffusional point of view <clears throat> is an atomically thick layer of alpha and one atomic layer of beta, right? That means that there's essentially no diffusion that ha has to happen. Um, and this can then grow just as fast as a single phase pure solid. But that that's impossible, right? Because the alpha and beta don't mix, right? They, they phase separate for a reason, which means that alpha alpha bonds and beta beta bonds are more preferred than alpha beta bonds. <clears throat> so therefore, anywhere we have this interface is going to be in a higher energy configuration than stuff in between. So what we really want is a balance between 
diffusion and interfacial energy. Right? And that's what's going to determine this eutectic spacing. Okay? Um, and we're not going to get into a quantitative analysis of it in the book, I, like the book does. I just really want you guys to appreciate that this is a cooperative um, growth effort, right? And that the structure is going to depend on both the, def the composition, the diffusivity, the thermal gradient, and the um, interfacial energy, right? So let me ask just one last question and we'll come back and, and we'll talk about it on Wednesday, the answer. But I want everyone to think about if I have a steeper thermal gradient or a larger undercooling, will I have a wider eutectic spacing or a finer eutectic spacing? Right? So think about that for Wednesday and we'll start there. So Wednesday, we will finish up this slide of notes and then Friday, we'll get started on diffusion. Okay, so have a good one, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a couple days. Before you go. Sure. Can you go back to the, where you said the homework question was all like the, what was it, the, the refining? This, the zone refining question? No, uh, the ones with the N values. I can't remember what exactly what it was called. Oh, um, on homework three? Yes. Okay, hold on. Um, I got to pull that up. Well, just go to the slide is what I'm saying from the oh. Uh, I'm not sure which slide that is. The one that has the multiple lines all converging on a central point with like the different end values, the logarithmic scale. Oh, the zone refining. The why it reaches, uh, shoot, where did that, I just closed it. Um, Yes, that one. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So what's the question? I'm just trying to understand it better for the homework. Cause you said you gave us the, you practically gave us the answer inadvertently, but I couldn't really tell what the answer was. Ah, so I asked. Yeah, that. So I asked about, z the homework question is about zone leveling. Part of the problem is I haven't started the homework yet because I've been very busy with this lab report all weekend. So this is the homework I just posted that's not due Friday. Oh, it's homework four. This is homework. The, quest, the, the question I was talking about is homework is on homework four. Oh, okay. So yeah, could you help explain the zone leveling a bit? So I understand that um, these, as the number of passes increases, the composition will become pure and pure at a very, at an exponential rate or yeah. weight rate. And they all converge as they do so, the X, this, as they reach the X composition, they will become closer and closer to being pure. Yeah. At 100, but what is the leveling? I was a little confused on that. Okay, so the zone leveling is a process that's related to zone refining that what you can do that that you can use to get a small but homogeneous composition of a dopant uh, in your material. Uh-huh. 
And the question I'm asking in the homework is, how could you, how would that work? How could you think of a process of, can you think about how you could make that work? Right? So in zone refining, if I just do multiple passes in the same direction, mm -hmm. I get this gradient in composition from one range of the bar to the other. Right. And of course, this is on a logarithmic scale. Right. And I may, right. I may be good. My, my composition that I'm trying to get is say 10 to the minus three. Right. Yes. So that means I need to cut half of my bar off. Right. But all of this is acceptable composition. Okay. Now the question then is, zone leveling is a related process where I want to get everything that's, I want to get everything even. I want to ho now hom homogenize my composition. Yes. So at one end of the bar, I have 10 to the minus seven, one end of the bar, I have 10 to the minus three, and I want to get to somewhere around 10 to the minus, a, a little more than 10 to the minus four homogeneously over the bar. How could I potentially go about doing that? Right, and that's that's what I'm asking about in the homework, mm -hmm. and um, so I want you to think about just think about that. You could refine to both of those ebbs, but yeah, I'll have to consider that more on my own. Consider it more on your own, right? And right, essentially, if you think about the zone refining, you're going from you're always moving the in the heat in one direction. Mm -hmm. Right. Think about what happens if I move in two directions. Right. Well, then it wouldn't be refined. It would just. Yeah. Anyway, so just think about that. Okay. So take care, everyone. And we'll talk to you on Wednesday.